All right, we are on. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we have a busy of unusual schedule ahead of us uh, for the next uh, for the next hour. Uh, so we'll uh, hear from colleagues from the CRG department who are here to share, uh, to, to talk about two surveys, uh, one on community engagement in uh, funding request development that already took place. And so we'll share some of the preliminary uh, findings and a survey that they are just putting out now. Uh, you might have seen the appeal, uh, the, the, call, the call for it on our, uh, on our list serve in the past. Uh, I think it came out yesterday. Um, and so they'll tell us about uh, a bit more about that. Um, we will talk quickly about antimicrobial resistance. Uh, the multi-stakeholder hearing is taking place today. We're not there, uh, but uh, we came out last week uh, with a HIV, TB, and malaria uh, brief on uh, on resistance, and just wanted to give everyone a bit of a sense of uh, how to engage in these discussions, uh, what was the value of it, and what was ahead, uh, and. Uh, chance for anyone on the call who's interested to get in touch with us uh, so that we can uh, connect you with people who are working more actively on the on the topic. Uh, and finally, we uh, held a, a GFAN meeting uh, now almost no, two months ago uh, in Bangkok, and we'll just do a quick report back, uh, share our uh, meeting report and some of the top line uh, uh, outcomes of the meeting. Um, so thank you all. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that uh, Gavin can share his. And as soon as that's up, uh, we can uh, get started with the CRG presentation. Uh, Gavin, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Quentin. Let me just get the presentation up. Can you confirm that you can see the presentation? Yes. I'm just putting it into presenter mode. Perfect. So um, I'm here to present on uh, an ongoing survey that we're doing in relation to a KPI, uh, KPI C1. Um, so what is this KPI? It's a KPI that seeks to measure the level of satisfaction of communities with their engagement across the, grant, the whole grant life cycle. And as Quentin mentioned, we issued the first survey last December and it closed in January that focused on funding request development. Um, and this current one is going to be focusing on grant making. And all, these two surveys are focused on countries that submitted in windows one to three. So what are we measuring? We're measuring satisfaction engagement by looking at uh, a continuum around meaningful engagement. The first being around voice, where the community feels able to express uh, their opinions, their, their needs, their realities, their priorities. The second of um, metric is around the level of attention uh, they feel um, that, that uh, decision makers were giving to them. The third is once, once you've been able to express uh, priorities and have attention of decision makers, whether there was a um, uh, decision makers were actively engaged in understanding. And remember that when we're looking at uh, participatory processes across multi-stakeholders, we're, we're then looking to see different perspectives and then going through a process of sort of allocative efficiency, um, given that there's limited funds. The fourth step is around action, whether um, beyond valuing uh, inputs, uh, as to whether in that allocative efficiency process, uh, community priorities were uh, actually actioned or that there was a, a valid reason for not actioning them. And then fifthly, whether this community engagement process led to um, uh, an improved understanding and foundation for relationship building. And, and this is related to uh, developing trust between partners. So the way that we, we measure this is that we do surveys, and we know that these surveys are going to give us uh, an incomplete picture. These surveys is just one, one uh, data point for us. We know that many partners develop their own reports and, and synthesize evidence for us. Um, we see studies like the RISE study, and also the Global Fund does another a number of, of different uh, processes from communities having to sign off on funding requests 
to applicant surveys and, and, and so forth. So this is just one data point that contributes uh, to our understanding around community engagement and satisfaction. Um, so sharing some results from the first survey, we didn't meet the target. The target is to reach 75% satisfaction at all three stages of the grant life cycle that we're interested in. So funding request development, grant making and implementation. Um, we, we, we got a, a number out call of 68%, but we see within this quite a, a, a variance um, a, a, a when we start looking at different populations. However, what we want to say at this stage is, you know, we're only looking at uh, a limited stage of the grant life cycle with a limited number of, of country respondents. We also uh, noticed that whilst we had quite a good sample size of 1,194, it, was poor, it wasn't it was perfectly distributed. So this is not a representative uh, sampling. Um, and we need to sort of really be conscious of the limitations before we start extrapolating uh, definitive conclusions. In this slide, you can sort of see the response with the highest number of uh, responses from high impact Africa one and two, and the least from Southeast Asia and uh, LAC region. When uh, we look at the satisfaction, it actually varies across different regions with the highest level of satisfaction uh, reported from uh, high impact Asia and, and for LAC. But again, just pointing out the, 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 the numbers that are responding to this before we start to make too many conclusions. But we are interested in trends and, and, and patterns. And when we start looking at disease variation, malaria respondents had the most satisfaction rather than HIV. So this raises really interesting questions. Do malaria respondents have lower expectations of engagement, for example? Um, and do conversely, do HIV uh, activists um, who have got a longer history around community engagement have higher expectations? So we're generating many questions at, at this stage. Um, when we look at the different questions, and, and this goes along that, that voice to partnership continuum, we note that um, the highest level of, of satisfactions are around the overall process, um, but it drops um, when we're asking around how the opinions are actually informing uh, the funding request. Similarly, when we start looking at communities, um, whilst we have a, a general sort of drop off in satisfaction um, as we get to the action um, uh, metric that we're looking at, for most communities, it bounces up um, towards the end. But for people who use drugs um, and transgender diverse communities, we're, we're getting the lowest level of satisfaction. And interestingly, we don't get that upswing of the process having uh, led to uh, an increase in, in, in trust. And we're particularly interested in this dynamic that, you know, when we talk about communities, really recognizing the heterogeneous nature of communities. And, and whilst the process may be uh, more satisfying or acceptable for some partners, we're interested in those partners, obviously, um, who are not satisfied. And, and um, we should say that in our analysis, we're really looking at a positive and negative deviance approach to see where, where things are working uh, well and where things are not working well. Where we look at, um, when we look at those respondents who um, were not engaged in funding request uh, development, um, there are particular groups that, that show as not being engaged, people with disabilities um, and, and young people. Both these groups, as well as uh, migrants, mobile populations and displaced people are traditionally not been uh, as well engaged as we would like to be. We know it's a continued area of action. We, we are pleased that there are some groups who have traditionally not been so well engaged that have, um, that, that, that have performed better in this survey, including women and girls. However, this is you know, just the first set of, of, of data uh, for this KPI, and we do really want to get uh, more data from um, other stages, uh, i.e. for Windows uh, 4 onwards, and also different stages of the grant lifecycle. 
I appreciate I've just run through. I've tried to leave um, more data on the slides than I've been, than I've speaking to. Quentin is keeping me to a very tight timeline to allow for more uh, discussion, but I want to now sort of move on to the second survey. So this is the link to the second survey. We'll be uh, sharing um, through the GFAN list server, but also through social media. And we really um, would welcome your support in ensuring um, that we can have the maximum participation in the survey to get to get as wider uh, range of perspectives as possible. Just a reminder that the survey is to be completed by communities most affected by the three diseases. Um, so not necessarily, um, uh, well, definitely not uh, government or, or technical partners or, 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 or bilateral partners. So the survey is currently live. It'll be open until the 16th of June. So I think that's about a five week window period. And just highlighting that we have other surveys planned. Um, so later this year, we'll be doing a funding request survey for Windows 4 to 6, followed by a grant making survey for Windows 4 to 6 next year. And next September, we intend to do a grant implementation survey uh, for Windows 1 to 6. So hopefully you've got an idea around the, the, the frequency um, and, and the timeline that surveys will, will be coming to. If you have questions, um, around uh, the survey or the KPI, we'd encourage you to reach out to the learning hubs. There is also um, contact details uh, for us that we'll make sure that we pass on after this. It's also in, in, in the slide deck, but the regional learning hubs would be more than happy uh, to help respond to any questions that you may have. So that's it from me. Um, again, just sharing a, a link and a QR code for the survey. And uh, Quantan, it's uh, I managed to wrap up in ten minutes exactly. I, I I will not say that I was I was expecting any less, but uh, really well done. Guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so thanks thanks a lot for the presentation. Do we have any questions from uh, from anyone regarding the outcome of the survey, the methodology, uh, anything you would like to see, like? Questions you would like to see answers for the next surveys that could be useful feedback for the for the department. Anything from from anyone? Yes, please go Quick ahead. Question. Again. Sorry, I get that first, then Lizzie. Okay. Um. Thank you so much, um, Gavin, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I'm sorry, I am not able to open my camera at the moment. Um. My name is Agatha. I'm a trans woman. My pronouns are they, she, and I'm from Youth Lead Asia Pacific, the Asia Pacific Network for Young Key Populations. Uh, I want to ask, um, are there any segregated data based on age to see the differences between how young people and adults are, uh, perceive the community engagement in the global fund processes? Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Agatha. And Lizzie, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Just a quick question. Looks like, um, you know, like people with disabilities keeps falling under the category of groups that are being left behind. I just need to know with the survey, was there like feedback on how that can be mitigated? Okay, that's two questions. Uh, Gavin, do you want to take those? And then if anyone else has questions, yeah, please write yeah. them. Your hand. Agatha and, and Lizzie, thank you both uh, for your questions. So, to Agatha, we are um, we are able to disaggregate the data by age. I didn't show it in this slide. Um, I can actually see if we could add the slide uh, to the slide deck around age, and we'd be happy to uh, update the slide deck that we sent to Quentin so we could uh, make sure you get the a, a version with the age disaggregation. Um, as I say, we, 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 at this stage, we're just trying to compile more data rather than making two conclusions. I find it really interesting that young people generally are poor respondents to global fund surveys um, because obviously young people uh, have a, valency, a strong valency to be able to use technology. We're also very conscious around that this sampling methodology is based on access to 
uh, technology and ability to, to, to connect technology. And we understand that as, as one of the limitations and is helping us think through how we might adapt the survey uh, for a, a, a further iteration, which will only be done for the next grant life cycle because we want to show, have in, a consistency as we apply the methodology during the current uh, cycle. And Lizzie, um, we haven't had that many suggestions around um, how to improve the inclusiveness of uh, people with disabilities. We're obviously um, going to be spending some time looking at the community annexes of highest priorities to see who is in the room and who is outside the room, because I do think that this is, we're, we're particularly interested to trying to understand who is not in the room. And we do have a, a thematic evaluation. And I really appreciate you raising the point because I will make sure that I note it to the um, to the uh, learning and evaluation office for them to consider as they do the thematic evaluation, which will be, which will sort of go far deeper than a, a survey of this kind is able to go. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gavin. I saw a few hands being raised and then being lowered. Don't don't be shy. There's no there's no bad question. Uh, I saw one from Simon. Do you want to go ahead with your question? Yes, please go ahead. So much. This is Simon Ayewale from Uganda, and uh, I represent the Fisher Folk constituency at the national level. I want to appreciate Global Fund uh, at the, the, the processes right from planning. I really see community well involved, but uh, my ask here would be at the implementation level, I, I would love also to see uh, nobody left behind. Because if you, when, when you look at the global modular friend, framework, brings out constituency priorities very clearly. And the, <clears throat> these would be the sensitive constituencies to really articulate their issues even at implementation level because they understand better their constituencies. But uh, to my surprise, at implementation level, you will find some of these priority populations left behind, and you may find some other networks engaged to implement on their behalf, which wouldn't make a meaningful engagement. I submit, thank you. Thanks a lot, Simon. And uh, Gavin, I don't know if you want to add to that. Uh, I think the implementation side of things is going to be covered by uh, later on in the implementation survey. Absolutely. It, it will be uh, carried, it will be addressed through the implementation survey, which will be done uh, next year. But I do think that we need, you know, we're very conscious to look context by context around uh, what key and vulnerable populations are being included. Um, given our commitment to ensure that, you know, in each context, those people who are most affected by the three diseases are, are involved. And as I said earlier, we know that traditionally we have some uh, issues, people with disabilities, young people, uh, malaria communities, uh, migrants and displaced people. And, and it really is thinking it through in each context, how can we try and increase the inclusivity of, 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 of people? And also, I mean, what's been quite um, pleasing in this in so far uh, during um, funding crest development for grant cycle seven is that we're getting quite a lot of anecdotal e evidence about new people being involved in in funding request development and I think that that's important as well as having the sort of the the stay hard long long term champions there that we are getting um we are reaching uh new subpopulations but also people from different geographical uh regions in country thanks thanks a lot gavin and we have one uh, one question for monismus go ahead <laughs> yeah th 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 thank you very much and uh, um, i just want to follow up on what gavin just said about uh, Young people not so responsible yet, probably they expect this group to be very active and they are probably more responsible. Probably, Gavin, you may want to take into consideration the diversity of young people because when we have this survey. 
Onesimus, the sound is quite bad. Do you want to type your question in so that uh, we can properly answer it? Because we really can't hear, uh, at least I can't hear much. Uh, Most of the young people age based because you have young people in the Champions League, uh, people using drugs. So this day, but sometimes actually much more sensitive of young people because they actually respond at other key population groups other than young people. Such. So you may want to consider this diversity. Uh, thanks, Onesimus. We, we didn't hear much of uh, of your intervention, actually. The sound was quite bad. If you want to type it in, uh, in the chat, if that's possible, uh, unless, Gavin, if, I don't know if you heard better than I am, because I'm quite Yeah, bad. I think he was talking about um, having a look at the, you know, uh, uh, key populations across age, but I, I would also submit across gender as well. Uh, obviously, we're interested in those... Um, those disaggregations. Um, the slight tone of caution is to start thinking the, these samples might be representative because although you start with a thousand people, once you start then looking at a population group and then you disaggregate by age, um, the, the numbers actually are, are relatively small to be building conclusions on. But we are interested in as I said earlier, particularly looking at patterns and trends, and then referring these to the thematic evaluations that are able to really get in uh, at the at, at country level and, and unpack uh, some of the dynamics around community engagement. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Gavin. And uh, Onesimus, I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, please uh, give us a ping in the, in the chat. Uh, the, uh, Gavin, I actually have a question uh, since I don't see any hands up. Did you did you find big differences country to country? Like, do you know? Do you have somewhere uh, what country had the highest level of satisfaction? And um, somewhere else, what uh, what country had the lowest? I know that like which countries which could be sensitive, but can you give us a sense of like how high satisfaction was getting and how low satisfaction gets in the in the sample? We do have that information. We're not going to be reporting at country level. Uh, we'll only report at, at, the, at the regional level. And I am quickly trying to go and have a look. Um, I, I don't particularly want to be uh, calling out uh, countries, but um, I would say that the vast majority of countries were in a range of sort of 59% to 65% um, uh, satisfaction. Uh, but there are some specific outliers. Um, uh, and, and so a, uh, a country who, whose president might, 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 might involve the surname Putin was probably was the lowest country uh, that, that, that came. So we do, we, you know, and I don't, I don't think there's any particular surprise that some of the particular countries we know are very restricted. Um, and we will be digging into that. Again, pointing out that the sample size of, or the respondents, um, the number of respondents varies and, and where we have less than a, a 10 respondents, you know, we have to be very careful about drawing a conclusion on the basis of, of, of limited respondents. So again, it's a, a good segue for me to, to be asking once again for um, GFAN and GFAN members' support in disseminating this. Uh, the, the, the more responses we get, um, the more significant the, the data is. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Gavin. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, it was, it's just also get a sense of, uh, of sort of how you know what the data looks like country to country to get a to to I don't know I find it interesting to get a sense of where you know where are the lessons to be learned where are the, the uh, models to be avoided in a sense uh, and yeah in I not surprised to hear that you find a few outliers especially when it comes to negative uh, negative things just because we know that uh, the situation can be quite bad in a number of countries. I don't see any more questions. Uh, it's still, there's still a minute or two, actually. We're, we're a bit ahead of schedule. I'm very proud of everyone. Um, I see one question in the chat from uh, Gayane on the ECA platform. Yeah, I think I can answer that, actually. Yes, I think the, for, for uh, region, regional specific information, uh, the, uh, the learning hubs, uh, and so in that case, the. Uh, the ECA platform will be the right, uh, the right 
person to reach the right group to reach out to uh, to get uh, to get more details uh, and more and more information any any other question uh, either in the chat or in the room one time two time three times all right so we'll when i go back to the rest of our agenda and i want to thank uh really gave gavin and the rest of the uh, crg team for uh for coming today and i really want to encourage everyone to uh, take the time to fill the uh the, the next survey uh because as he as he said these surveys are only as uh, as useful as a uh, as a number of people that actually uh take the time to to answer them uh, i also want to point out that you know we we can feel like our individual experiences may not be uh, may not always be relevant, but they really uh, it it is really useful and important to get uh, a sort of big picture, and that's how you transform anecdotes into actual uh, into action, right? By right? making sure that uh, you create you create ev evidence on the basis of your uh, of your of the experience that you have on the ground. Uh, so I think uh, if do you have can you share uh, Gavin? Can you share the link to the uh, survey you just launched in the chat um, to make sure that uh, people have access to it. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, and so we'll move on to uh, the next part of our agenda, which has to do with uh, HIV, TB, malaria, and AMR. Uh, so first, I want to share in the chat uh, for all of you to enjoy uh, the brief we launched uh, last week. Uh, it's uh, so we had a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of health uh, high level meeting in the past few years. Uh, we had HIV in 2021, in 2023, we had TB, we had PPR and we had UHC. Uh, in 2024, this year in September, we'll have the uh, AMR challenge on antimicrobial resistance. Oh, sorry, I saw a very quick question in the chat. I wanna make sure that we're not moving ahead too fast. Okay. Tup, tup, tup. Okay. Uh, Gavin, I'll let you take the, the question, uh, question directed to you in the uh, in the chat. Uh, thank you. So as I was saying, so we uh, will have an antimicrobial resistance uh, yeah, high level meeting. It's um, it's not an obvious space for engagement by uh, around HIV, TB, and malaria. Uh, we know that at the start of a the process, there is a general lack of awareness among um, advocates. Uh, of the importance of engage, uh, engaging in that space. And so that's why we uh, connected with a few colleagues, uh, we in particular at uh, LHL International, uh, at, uh, based in, uh, out of Norway, uh, Fondet out of Denmark, and uh, Results UK out of the UK. Uh, and together we worked on that, uh, on, on that brief with the objective of uh, giving everyone the basic the basic knowledge of how to engage in that space. So I'm just going to take a few seconds to uh, summarize some of the key points we raised uh, in that brief, uh, and then talk a bit more about uh, how to use that information to engage into, uh, into those discussions. Um, so uh, the brief talks about, uh, like, gives a quick, uh, a quick you know, definition of what antimicrobial resistance means uh, and sort of a few basic facts about when people generally talk about AMR, what are they talking about? Um, and the sort of the top line uh, things to, to get from that is that some of the conversation around uh, antimicrobial resistance, so that's uh, when a disease becomes resistant to, uh, to the tools we have to fight it. So uh, whether it's antiviral, if it's a virus, uh, if it's uh, you know uh, a fungus, antifungal, mostly we're talking about antibiotics for bacteria. Uh, there is a, I think there is an, an idea out there that this is a rich country problem uh, because that's in rich countries that people have large access to antibiotics and uh, there's been a lot of cam uh, campaigning uh, aiming at the general public in the 90s and early 2000s around the problem with misuse of, uh, of uh, antibiotics, etc. Um, that's not true at all. Uh, most of the burden of antimicrobial resistance is in low and middle income countries. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that the, the key factors uh, that lead to the rise and spread of resistance have to do with uh, access to prevention, access to diagnostic, diagnostics, and access to treatment. Uh, and then after that, treatment adherence. And all of these factors are uh, tend to be uh, we tend to be less barriers to each of these 
dimensions in uh, in wealthier countries. Uh, so the estimates of uh, the exact burden of uh, antimicrobial resistance vary uh, between one and a half and five million a year uh, uh, death, uh, depending on uh, depending on whether you count uh, dir directly attributable to resistance or not. Uh, what we thought was important for uh, advocates to know and to understand was how this issue of resistance overlaps with uh, HIV, TB, and malaria, because these are the diseases we mostly work on. Um, so in the brief, we talk uh, in a bit more length about how to, where these overlaps are. Uh, but to give you the, uh, a few top line ideas, um, in a, across the three diseases, uh, resistance is a problem. Uh, if you work on any of them, you already know this. Uh, on HIV, we see ARV resistance. It's on the rise. It's a problem uh, at the individual level, as you know, uh, as people go on to stay on uh, ARV for a long time, they have to regularly change the treat, uh, their uh, their regimen to make sure that resist to because it's it, it loses efficacy. Um, it's also a problem for uh, new infection, where we see tre treatment failure early on in people who are not suppressed uh, because the because of it, uh, they were infected with a um, with a resistance strain. Um, in, uh, in TB, we see a really big contribution uh, to, AM, to the AMR burden. So one of the very clear overlap uh, when it comes to AMR and uh, HIV, TB, and malaria uh, is really on TB. TB is, I think, the seventh uh, largest contributor to AMR deaths. Uh, but unlike in HIV and in malaria, uh, it, it's not rising. We see that the number of people uh, infected and dying of uh, uh, of drug resistant TB uh, has been stable and lowering over the past uh, over the past few years. So it's a very high number, but it's a lowering number, which is uh, which, which is reassuring. Uh, and finally, in malaria, we find uh, resistance to artemisinin, which is the current uh, best for, uh, first line uh, first line treatment. But it's a growing issue, uh, but it's still fairly low burden. The way, the way resistance manifests in malaria is a bit different. It tends not to lead to treatment failure, but just to, uh, uh, to the need to lengthen the treatment to fully clear the parasite, uh, which means that you might need to take pills for one or two more days. Uh, so that's a problem, uh, at the, especially when we're looking at the population level. Uh, but, um, but it's not, it's not exactly the same. The same. Uh, category of problem as uh, with HIV and TB, uh, where we, you do see complete treatment failure. Uh, that's the overlap. Um, and so the rest of the, the rest of the brief talks about uh, the role of a global fund and uh, in uh, in in fighting against resistance. Um, and the uh, and we I didn't like. Ooh, I recommend you read the draft. You read the brief. What we. Uh, what we highlight is uh, the Global Fund is an extremely large funder and implementer of programs. And so anything that uh, the fund does has a very large scale impact. So the fund needs to be uh, conscious of that uh, and use uh, and be careful in the way it implements this program as to uh, contribute to a reduction of, uh, of resistance. The Global Fund invests uh, in prevention, which is the key step to prevent the rise and spread of resistance. If you don't get sick, uh, you know, there's no chance for resistance to emerge and resistance is not a problem. Um, the, access, the access to diagnostics is a key issue as well. Uh, if you're not diagnosed well, you might be given the wrong kind of, uh, of treatment. And that, again, can lead to resistance. Uh, and so the uh, huge efforts that are being made by the Google Fund to give broader access to diagnostics is key here. Uh, access, again, once you've been diagnosed, uh, you need to have access to high quality treatment and you need to be able to stay on treatment. So adherence is important. Uh, so if you have stockouts, that's opportunities for resistance to develop, et cetera. Um, and so again, uh, you know, we know what the Global Fund has been doing to make uh, treatment more broadly accessible. Um, and finally, uh, the, the way the Global Fund invests in, uh, in laboratory capacity and that relates to diagnostics, um, uh, is and the way it contributes more generally to pandemic preparedness and to uh, health system strengthening our general contribution to uh, to a fight against uh, AMR. But what we think is the key, and sorry for burying the lead here, what we think is really the key issue uh, when it comes that that advocates like us can bring to the discussion of antimicrobial resistance is that it's a first of all an equity issue. 
And here I want to talk quickly about uh, the uh, AMR HLM, and I'm putting in the chat uh, quite a bit of information around uh, different ways to different uh, ways and opportunities to uh, to engage. But the so this, this is the second uh, a, a, a antimicrobial resistance uh, high level meeting that the UN is organizing. It will take place. Uh, so the first one took place in 2016. The second one will take place on the 26th of uh, September in uh, in New York. Um, the HIV, TB, and malaria are a very small part of the AMR uh, conversation. Uh, what is important to understand is that the way it is talked about as an issue uh, is extremely medicalized. It's very much focused on R and D, uh, and there's a big part of the conversation is on animal and uh, animal and environmental health uh, because the use of antibiotics. Uh, in, in animals and farming in particular uh, is a big driver of resistance. Uh, so it's a big part of the conversation. And so for all of these reasons, uh, the, if, we, if we try to focus on, uh, if we try to focus too much on putting HIV, TB and malaria at the forefront of this conversation, uh, there's room for a lot of pushback uh, from people who have been working on these topics for a long time. Uh, what we can bring is, uh, the realization that uh, AMR is first and foremost an access and equity issue, because these are the issues we work on. Uh, we need to fight against the idea that it's, uh, that it's a purely medical problem, purely technical problem, a purely R&D problem, that it's a matter of people misusing, overusing uh, antibiotics. These are issues, uh, but so much more has to do with access, so much more to do with equity, access to treatment, access to diagnostics, uh, access to prevention. Um, and so that's really what we hope that uh, advocates coming from uh, the world of HIV, TB, and malaria can bring to these conversations, uh, reminding people of the importance of access in fighting the rise of, in fighting resistance. Um, so yeah, uh, so I've put uh, I've put in the chat uh, uh, a number of uh, a number of resources that you can use. Uh, in particular, uh, the first AMR uh, declaration. Uh, the, so the first political declaration on AMR. Uh, we have colleagues at React that have produced an analysis early on, uh, which uh, we found to be to be very useful to get a sense of what are the key issues uh, that are, that will be coming up. Our colleagues at React and with Wacky Health, and I saw someone else announcing in the chat earlier, are organizing a webinar next week, uh, where in particular we will debrief uh, um, the multi-stakeholder hearing that is taking place in New York today. I think on the fifteenth. Um, and finally, I want to say that if you have any interest in uh, working, if you're already working on AMR or have interest in working on AMR some more, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, so I put my email in the in the chat, uh, and I'll try to put you in touch with uh, more people that are more actively engaged on uh, on these issues. Uh, because as GFAN, we are interested, uh, but this is not the our, our core our core mandate. Um, so this is what we have on the. On AMR again, uh, and sorry, coming back one slide. I want to share our uh, our brief, which we've put up on the website. Do we have any questions? Is there anyone who is uh, either who is in New York can tell us about uh, the uh, any any things they heard about the, uh, about the stakeholder hearing, uh, or want to share work that they have done or intend on uh, on doing on the uh, on AMR? Uh, please raise your hand or put something in the chat. All right. Uh, and so if anyone is being shy, uh, do not hesitate to reach out to me uh, and we uh, and I'll put you in touch with people that are, we've created a uh, small email share with a small group. Uh, of people that are uh, trying to do more work around uh, around the uh, HIV, TB, malaria, and the AMR, uh, and so we will look forward to engaging more people in that uh, in that work. So, since I see no question, I'll move on to uh, the rest of our agenda. Um, and so, it's a, a very short debrief uh, of our uh, of a meeting we held in Bangkok uh, in uh, in March. Uh, so uh, GFAN every year uh, has a strategy meeting uh, where we're bringing, uh, oh, sorry, I see a question. I don't want to move on, move on too fast. Lizzie, do you want to go ahead? Yes, please. Sorry about that. Um, no. so I, know, 
I know during COVID-19, AMR was themed as the pandemic we kind of are ignoring, which is true. And I know mm -hmm. when it comes to global funding, ideally they're looking at the preventative angle, which is good. But I agree with you. It's a matter of access. And uh, I just need to know in terms of access to information, because when we say AMR, uh, the, the abbreviation itself looks like it's a high level sort of a discussion and, and it looks like we're cutting off the communities and the CSOs and getting, you know, involved in this kind of discussions. So when we talk about AMR um, and access to information, because it's just misusing antibiotics, it's, it's when you break it down on a layman's language, it's something that communities can actually understand and they'll know, oh, okay, every time I feel like, you know, I have this, I go get antibiotics and, you know, that already is not good for my health. So when it comes to access to information, um, how is the Global Fund trying to trickle that down, especially an AMR, and this looks like it's a completely new baby that's being integrated with the three diseases? I just need to know in terms of access. Yeah, uh, no, it's a very good question. One thing uh, I'm putting in the chat is the uh, re results has put out, uh, I think, a really good report that does a very good job of pointing out in, t in the case of TB in particular, uh, what do we mean when we talk about, when we say AMR? And yeah, I apologize if I, like, because I've been working on this for, for now a couple of, couple of months, uh, the, the abbreviations come out of my mouth a lot. But what that means is essentially that the drugs aren't working. That's the title of a report. Uh, and that's, that's what we're talking about. Uh, the, we, we see more, like, it's not, it's not a new thing. We found uh, drugs have stopped working against, uh, against diseases for as long as we've used antibiotics. Um, but it's uh, more and more of an it's more and more of an issue. So, your question about access to information, honestly, we have had this, the exact same problem, and that's why we wanted to put out that brief. Uh, it's got a few sources in it, uh, so uh, if you want to go look at it, uh, the, it points you towards where to learn more. Uh, but there is, a, but but it, I feel it still remains very technical, uh, not particularly easy to access. Uh, we hope that the uh, that the brief does a decent job at uh, you know putting things in simple terms uh, and 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 especially putting um, you know things in perspective in terms of scale how many people are we talking about where are they etc. Um, but you find very little very very few sources on uh, you know the uh, the role of the role of communities of local communities in uh, in in doing like you know uh, how, how can you take action against uh, against anti uh, against resistance uh, what can people do to make sure that uh, the antibiotics that they have access to are the right ones are uh, you know are not uh, like aren't fake aren't fake aren't expired uh, is, uh, which are both big issues um, yeah so i don't have a good answer to the access to information truth is we had to dig we dig quite a bit to find uh, accessible material. Uh, I don't know if anyone else was uh, was on the call. I know that uh, our colleague Leila from NHL who helped us uh, work on the brief. I think I saw her uh, at some point. Uh, so I don't know if she can point you out towards uh, towards better resources. We know that uh, as far as the Global Fund is concerned, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, uh, but that's for these very reasons. That's not an issue that they were uh, looking at closely uh, last year. Uh, when uh, we talked about it uh, in uh, on the sidelines of one of the board uh, and a number of people that were there from the secretariat when just not not like had not been paying attention to uh, to the AMI challenge considering that you know the the free the uh, TB and uh, HIV had had very challenge recent very challenge recently that those were the ones that mattered and that the AMI question was. Uh, wasn't as as important relevant of course it's integrated their work etc cetera, etc cetera. and you can you can find uh you know they, they especially this year we've been talking a lot about the work we do uh to fight amr but it's still yeah it's still slight it's, it's still it's still not that much so uh, good point i do i do think our brief is pretty good in pointing out uh you know at more sources but a lot of them are quite technical and so they, they're not they're not particularly easy to access uh, so sorry, it's not. It's not. I don't know how much I. Uh, I don't know how much I. I helped there, uh, but uh, but it's a very good point. It's a very good question. And that's really the, That's really why we wanted to, uh, to bring the issue to everyone's, uh, 
uh, to everyone's attention. And I think, uh, and I'm going to put it out again, but the, uh, I think the right people to ask these questions to will be people at React, uh, who have been actually doing, trying to do a lot to make, the, like, they come from very technical background, uh, but they have been, I find, really good at trying to uh, break down the issue, explain it to layman's term, uh, and focusing on action uh, and on what can be done. And they're co-hosting that webinar next week uh, with Wacky Health. And uh, that's, I think, a very good starting point uh, into, into the issue and specifically towards uh, VHLM. Mm. All right. Um, hey, do we have any more questions before I go back to my to my next slide? And thanks again for, for dropping it, Lizzie. All right, I don't see one. I will move on. Um, so as I said, so uh, GFAN every year uh, holds a strategy meeting. Um, we gather key members of an, uh, key members of the network. Uh, we usually have about sixty to eighty people, and we tend to be oversubscribed. So it's been a, it's been a bit tough in the past few years because we have more people wanting to come than we can really uh, have at the meeting. Um, so this time around, we met in Bangkok. Uh, we were in Nairobi the year before, uh, and we we're in Germany the year before that. Um, and this specific meeting, the objective was uh, to prepare the replenishment campaign. So uh, at the time of the meeting in March, there was 18 months to the eighth replenishment, uh, which is, as you know, the core of our work. Um, and so we mapped out uh, what were some of the key events, key themes, key issues uh, looking forward. And so uh, we wanted to, um, yeah, we wanted to, Give you all a chance to sort of uh, know what the top line messages were coming out of our of our meeting. Um, it was a lot, lot to be very honest, of gloom and doom. Uh, we've heard again and again that this is going to be the hardest ever replenishment. Uh, all all the big donors are you know cutting budgets right and left. Um, they you know we had this, this the ongoing conversations about the Lusaka agenda. So you know. Uh, to an extent, attempts for uh, for donors to uh, find reasons to pull away. Uh, they talk about coordination because they see lots of people making demands. There's a lot of replenishment between now and the eighth replenishment. I think there's five major uh, replenishment coming up, so there's a lot of competition, which makes everything difficult. Uh, there are disputed elections uh, in, uh, I forget the numbers, but in most countries, uh, from now until uh, until September 2025, um, and uh, that really makes everything very unpredictable. Of course, everyone has their eyes on the U.S. because it's the largest donor, uh, and the election there is particularly uh, contentious. Uh, we've one uh, candidate in particular who uh, is not particularly inclined uh, towards uh, generally towards uh, towards aid and cooperation. Uh, so. There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of discussion of the risks associated to that, uh, but the U.S. isn't the isn't the only one. There will be elections in most major donors and most implementing countries uh, for the, in the next uh, in the next year. It's a very busy calendar in the next eighteen months. Uh, we, we, in part because of COVID, uh, we really see global health everywhere. There's been lots of initiatives that have sp uh, sprouted over the past uh, you know three four years. A lot of different conversations are happening in parallel. And so uh, there's a need to prioritize among uh, advocates and there's a need to coordinate. Uh, it's, we can't have everyone doing everything all at once. Uh, and so we, the message throughout was trying to identify what everyone else was doing to have a better sense of what we need to do, um, each of us. Um, and the last one, uh, and that was also part of a gloom and doom, is that we heard a lot about fatigue, especially HIV fatigue uh, on the donor side. People saying that you know HIV is uh, it's it's uh, it's yesterday's topic. Uh, we now we're looking at other things. We want to look at uh, non uh, you know non communicable disease. We want to look at uh, UHC more broadly, which are all important topic. All things that you know do need more investment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but uh, we heard it. We heard it from the room. We heard it from the presenters. We can't. We, we can't let that sort of messaging uh, 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 through, right? Like we we can't forget what it was like 
uh, 20 years ago when the global fund was created when we uh, you know when there was when there wasn't that investment that had been done uh, to fight against the three diseases and because we're talking about uh, you know disease that spread if you if you take off the lid if you stop investing if you stop fighting they come back uh, and so the the need to come back to a very strict uh, very clear very strict message messages uh, on refocusing on the three diseases uh, less discussions of pandemic preparedness less discussions of uh, the intersection with climate change not that these topics aren't important uh, but by by overtly focusing on the next new shiny topic uh, we there was a fear that we we're losing sight of uh, of the fundamentals um, so that was these were sort of a few uh, top line messages that we heard again and again during the meeting i'm uh, putting in the chat the link to the meeting report so you can read uh, so you can read more about it but the one thing i want to bring to your uh, to your attention that's in the report and that will be even more relevant in the next couple of weeks um is the is the gfan civil society ask uh, for both of you who have been around for some time uh, you will know that uh, gfan uh, every every replenishment pulls out uh, a civil society ask which we is sort of a, a shadow report uh, in advance of uh, uh, of investment case the idea being we propose our own analysis our own number based on the same underlying data as the global fund. Uh, but we try to, uh, oh, sorry, someone is, I'm gonna force me someone, oh, there you go. Um, so we use the same data, but we uh, we don't, we assume that uh, the need needs to be fully met, which is not an assumption that the global fund, that, uh, the global fund makes. Uh, and we use that to project uh, what we really, what we really need uh, to be, to be on track to the targets that you know our governments have committed to uh, for 2030 in particular. Um, so we had uh, in 2018 we had an ask of 18 billion. Uh, in uh, 2021 we had an ask of 26.5. Uh, we did not meet those asks, uh, as you might know. We didn't even hit uh, 18 billion last time around. The feedback we got from uh, at the meeting as we were starting to work on our civil society ask this time around was that. It was a lot less important to advocates to have an earlier, larger number, which is what we expect uh, to, to come out with, uh, in part because there already was, uh, you know, there already was a target to work, to, to work towards the 18 billion. We don't know what the invest, investment case will come out, uh, come out to be, but we already have a basis for conversation. Right? We can already say like at least 18 billion because that's what we wanted last time. That's what we need next time. Uh, so there was less value there uh, in uh, for us to present a number. And so we've used that feedback uh, and we're going to have a bit of a different structure this time for, for ask. Uh, we'll, instead of focusing on a single number, we'll present scenarios because we want to make clear that we are at the point where there's a lot less uncertainty than there was before on how much money we need and uh, to meet the 2030 targets. And so we can fairly easily tell policymakers, if this is the amount of money you're ready to put up, this is what you can get for it. And that means that if it's enough, we want to point out that a lot can be done. But if we're talking about stagnation, if we're talking about cutting back, they will be very real. We, we know what the consequences of that will be. We can know what the consequences of that will be. And so uh, we want to really highlight this time around that the, the agency and the choice uh, that uh, that decision makers have to renege again uh, uh, on their commitments they all committed to uh, to 2030 targets uh, and you know again and again at different uh, different HLM, different regional summits etc um it'll be a short document uh we aim to uh, keep it under 10 pages uh, and uh i mean the assumptions are not very important, but uh, we rely on the same data as the uh, as the global fund uh, using uh, so WHO, Stop TV, and uh, RBM partnership, um, and uh, we assume that the share of the global fund uh, will remain uh, will remain the same. Um, and we intend on uh, releasing that ask uh, at the AIS, uh, so uh, at AIDS twenty twenty four in Munich. So it'll be ready by then. So we just wanted to update you on what we were talking about at the meeting. Uh, the 
what we expect in the next 18 months, it's not a positive. Um, and uh, what we're working on uh, in, the, in the next couple of months uh, as we launch our own, uh, own side of a replenishment campaign. Is there any questions? I don't see any hands, it's very quiet in the chat. I've been listening a lot to the sound of my own voice now. Please go ahead, Lizzie. Sorry, uh, mine is uh, a bit of a shocker. I mean, uh, the idea of HIV being, you know, an old disease or something, I've had it all over. And that's because people are focused now on removed from the COVID-19. Now we've set up the pandemic fund, so they're all good to go. They've got backing. Now we're talking about um, climate change and there's a lot of money being moved to that side. So I feel ideally we need to figure out how to remain relevant and how to kind of remind them, you know, how human beings will forget easily, remind them where we were before now everything else cropped up. And uh, I feel like it's a bit unfair. We do not have, not to my knowledge, a working vaccine or a cure for, for HIV. So it really, it's not a matter of pleading for them to commit, but it's a matter of reminding them that, you know what, in order for us to eradicate this particular disease, we need to still put in a lot of money but my question is uh, a lot of funding is going to other avenues uh, and now we're talking about the pandemic treaty which also looks like might go round asking for another pool of funding what what is the global fund kind of how is global fund going to tackle all these other people who are knocking doors also and asking for a slice of the cake and yet the cake itself has been the same size but we now now we have more players asking for a piece of the cake I just need to do with that. Is there like a game plan uh, being cooked up or something? Because it's, um, I mean, WHA is this month. So really, there's a lot of questions around financing. So uh, I can't, like, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm worried about uh, answering on behalf of, uh, of the Global Fund Secretary. Um, so again, not to put words in their mouth, but from what, like, the... We talk about, there's barely anything else we talk about besides the fact that there will be so many replenishments coming up. Uh, you're right to point out the, uh, the pandemic accord. I, the, one of the upsides of the current state of conversations with the pandemic accord is that it seems that it's going to create a truly new channel that will not uh, dip into the same sort of budget lines, which is important from the look of things. It might come straight from the industry. Yeah, from, uh, the industry. Uh, so that might, be, might, might, that might be less of a competition. What will be competition is uh, WHO. Uh, Unitaid is talking about a replenishment. Gavi has his replenishment this summer. Um, the Pandemic Fund is talking about a replenishment next year. And uh, so the... Uh, like, there's obviously no answer. <laughs> As in, like, at some level all of these entities are in competition for the same budget lines. And so uh, but there is an understanding, and we heard it from the secretary again and again, that, the, that there needs to be a lot of coordination across the diff these different actors, that they are working together on a plan. Uh, they also all are going to try to make the best case they, uh, they can to you know, point out that what is the unique role that they play, or how... Uh, very are interlocked, meaning that you can't, you know, if you found one, but you don't found the other ones, like you, you the impact is lower across the board. Uh, so these were the things we we heard about and a lot about, uh, in particular, the collaborations with uh, with Gavi, uh, because you know, we share an office, we share offices now, uh, and they work very closely, in particular, with the rollout of the malaria vaccine. So the, like, I think the, but I think to, to some extent, these are like these are things that they, they have to say, right? Like the secretary has to say that they're working on co um, coordination. And if we have colleagues from the secretary that don't coordinate any of this, and I apologize for putting words in your mouth. Um, but uh, but it's like it is obviously a major challenge. Uh, everyone is uh, you know everyone is saying that they are collaborating with everyone at the same time. Uh, you know all of these entities are you know they all have their different mandates and they are obviously trying to get what they feel is a fair share a fair share of a pie. One of the challenges of, of the Global Fund specifically is that it's coming late into that uh, that calendar. It's among, like, there's a lot of replenishment taking place before that. At the same time, it is it is the largest and most established organization. So uh, the 
the fact that our operations are coming first doesn't mean that uh, budgets won't be committed early on uh, by, by states. That's where the elections really become a problem because a number of countries will be wary of making commitments before, um, before the elections take place. And so whether we will know what, like, it's very likely that we will not have a good sense until very late into the calendar of what uh, the final number is going to be. Uh, that's, again, something we heard a lot, that uh, the, the Secretariat will, is working hard to try to start the campaign early uh, to give people time, and at the same time, uh, to. but even though we're starting early, we might not, uh, we, we will not get a number until, like, the pledging conference, essentially, like, or the weeks leading to. Uh, but yeah, it's not like that's a it's a it's a it's a circle that you that we have to square. That's just it's an impossible answer. The answer is that like countries have to uh, countries have to put money behind their words. They make commitments. They have to honor them, and we have to just be relentless with that message. And we have to all work together, right? Like we cannot uh, we we are all being put in competition. But at the end of the day, people that benefit from this uh, from these entities are all the same, right? Like. We we can't we, we can't play favorites there. So that uh, that's the other side of it from our on our end. We out of time. Uh, is there any other hands up? I don't see any other hands up. Thanks a lot, Lizzie, for uh, uh, for for the uh, for the que question, the interventions. Uh, thanks you everyone for for joining us. Our next call will be in two weeks. We'll talk about the Lusaka agenda and we'll talk about uh, the, our plans and uh, colleagues' plans around the AIS. Uh, so we look forward to see you there. The invitation is already in your inboxes. Uh, and uh, we all wish you a very good rest of your day, evening or morning. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot, Quentin. Bye. Bye-bye.